I used to think that love was all I needed until I came across a Google paper which proved me wrong. It turns out attention is all you need. How do you get attention? Welcome to the world of Transformer Networks. They may not be able to transform you, but they can transform human language. And speaking of attention, make sure to like, subscribe, and shower the comments with praise. Constructive criticism, pointing out errors and questions are welcome as well. This will help other knowledge thirsty people find these videos. This is Colin Scow, and welcome back to a brand new data lit tutorial. In this episode, we're going to tackle a new breakthrough in the field of natural language processing. This is great for machine translation. It's also great for categorizing and summarizing text. This tutorial is going to be a bit more advanced than most since we are dealing with cutting edge discoveries and deep learning. Were you using Google Translate 10 years ago? I met my wife on a cruise ship in 2007 and we didn't speak the same language. So that formed our lifeline along with charades for the first few months of the relationship until my Spanish reached a decent level. We had lots of laugh out loud moments at the hilarious robotic translations. Well, if you've used it recently, it's a whole different experience. The translations feel much more human, and there are also many rich subtleties that it gets right which are impossible to translate literally. This comes from state-of-the-art neural network architecture along with massive amounts of training data from correct human translations. So, today's lesson is how to build your own translation engine using a transformer network, which is very likely what Google Translate itself is using now. So the first order of business is to go over some natural language processing basics real quick. If you're not familiar with these terms, I encourage you to do some research as they're necessary to fully understanding how neural networks process language. If you're going to analyze language, the first thing you need to know about are word vectors, also called embeddings. NLP is about transforming meaning into mathematical models, and word vectorization is the first tool which allows us to do that. Many NLP models focus on learning the most common words in a language. They have a vocabulary anywhere from the 10,000 to 500,000 most common words and everything else gets categorized with the label unk for unknown. Words in a vocabulary are given an integer index, generally in order of the most common occurrence. The model doesn't see the letters, just integer indexes. Word vectors, also called embeddings, is an array of numbers between negative one and one with an arbitrary number of dimensions such as 128, 256, 384, etc., which encode the meaning of the words. So how does a computer build a mathematical model of what words mean? It's an unsupervised learning process where a neural network with a single hidden layer the size of the embedding dimensions is fed a large volume of text and attempts to predict the word that comes both before and after the input word. You can train these yourself or download very high quality pre-trained models. And when you examine the vectors, you'll find abundant mathematical patterns between similar words. For example, if you subtract king minus queen, this will be nearly equal to man minus woman. Uh, and walking minus walked will be very similar to swimming minus swam. There's even very clear relationships between countries and capitals. So when you plug words into an NLP model, you generally plug their trained vectors in as inputs, which speeds up the learning process quite a bit. The next concept to understand are recurrent neural networks, or RNNs. This is an entire course in itself, so I'm going to give you a very simplified explanation. RNNs are used for learning patterns and sequences of data and are especially useful with sequences of words. Basically, you input data one step at a time and the RNN calculates a new hidden state which is then refed at the next step. There are then trained functions which decide which inputs are important to store and which parts of the hidden state can be forgotten. After the entire input sequence has been processed, the hidden state is then used to make inferences about the entire sequence. RNNs can be stacked in layers just like any other neuron. Machine translation is done through an architecture called sequence to sequence. For example, we can have a sequence of English words to a sequence of French words, even though they will possibly have different lengths. This is very similar to the autoencoder architecture that we learned about in my last video. 
Embeddings of the input words are fed into an RNN one word at a time. Then we get a single vector which encodes the entire sentence. This vector is then fed to a decoder which spits out one word at a time in the target language until the sentence is complete. Attention is a mechanism which significantly improved the performance of sequence to sequence models. The human mind's bandwidth to process information is narrow. For example, when you are driving, there are a million things which pass through your field of vision, but only a few of them are important for navigating safely to your destination. I remember when I first learned to drive feeling very overwhelmed by traffic lights, stop signs, and mirrors, and pedestrians all at once. But over a few months, my attention units got trained to automatically focus on what was important. Once that happened, I was able to drive with very little thinking involved. Following the exact same concept, deep learning results can be significantly improved when networks learn which data is most important to focus on in order to reduce the cost function. In machine translation, most words have several possible meanings. The only way to figure out the correct meaning is to look at the context the word is used in. For each token in the output sequence, attention is a probability distribution, all numbers in the vector add to one, which maps the relative importance each token in the input sequence for figuring out the correct translation. This is calculated through a softmax function. So now I think we've built up enough background for you to appreciate the innovation that is the Transformer Network. And the theme song is Attention is All You Need, which also happens to be the name of the paper by Google which introduces the concept. One of the biggest weaknesses of traditional recurrent networks is that sequences must be fed in step by step, each hidden state dependent on the last. This prevents parallel computing and makes training much slower. In fact, RNN training time increases in direct proportion to the sequence length. The transformer architecture is an innovation which eliminates RNNs completely, replacing them with simple feed-forward networks and attention units, which not only improve on state-of-the-art sequence-to-sequence results, but train an order of magnitude faster. This is because sequences can now be calculated in parallel rather than step-by-step. I'm going to give you a high-level overview of how machine translation works using the Transformer Network. This is likely exactly what Google Translate is using in production now. It's a bit complex and hitting every detail would result in a video of several hours, so I'm going to leave you links so you can study up on the details if you want to learn more or even code your own implementation. The Google paper was not completely clear on how everything is wired up, so I'd like to give a huge shout out to Jay Alamar for creating an amazing visual explanation which is crystal clear and makes everything easy to understand. You probably won't get everything in my first pass, but I will leave the link in the description and I highly encourage you to explore this more. So in this example, the goal is to translate a French sentence into English. At the highest level, we've got a black box where French goes in, English comes out. Popping open the hood, we find there's an encoding component and a decoding component. The encoding component is a stack of encoders. The paper uses six, but that's a hyperparameter that can be tuned. And the decoders consist of a stack of the same number. Each encoder layer is identical in structure, but they each have their own weights. Inside we'll find two sublayers. Self-attention and a feed-forward neural network, also referred to as multi-layer perceptron or fully connected layer. The self-attention layer helps the encoder look at other words in the input sentence as it encodes a specific word. In the decoder, it's looking at other words in the output sentence, which have already been translated. We're going to look at attention in more detail in a moment. The decoder layers are very similar to the encoder layers, but there's an additional attention layer in the middle, which allows the decoder to focus on specific words in the input sentence. Now, let's start visualizing how data flows through this network with tensors. I already explained word embeddings. Each word in the input sentence is embedded into a vector of 512. These vectors are generally imported pre-trained. The token in each position flows through its own path in the encoder. There are dependencies between these paths in the self-attention layer but each token path is independent in the feed-forward layer so they can be calculated in parallel, thus speeding everything up, especially with multiple GPUs. 
At a high level, what attention does is for every given token, it scores all the other tokens as to how important they are to understand in the context of that word. We have self-attention and we have encoder decoder attention, which maps the output tokens to the relevant input tokens. For example, we have the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Is it referring to the animal or to the street? In this example, we can clearly see that the network has learned that it is definitely referring to the animal. Let's look at self-attention in more detail. Now we get into matrices and weights. The first step in calculating self-attention is to create three vectors from each of the encoder's input vectors, in this case, the embedding of each word. For each word, we create a query vector, Q, a key vector, K, and a value vector, V. These vectors are created by multiplying the embedding by three weight matrices, which are initialized randomly and then trained with the network. The paper set the dimensionality of these vectors to 64, but that is another tunable hyperparameter. What do query key and value represent? They're just useful abstractions for thinking about attention. What's most important is the role they play in the calculations. The second step of calculating soft attention is to calculate a score. Starting with the first word, thinking, we need to score each word of the input sentence against this word. The score then determines how much focus to place on other parts of the input sentence as we encode a word at a certain position. To calculate the score, we simply take the dot product of Q1 and K1, then Q1 and K2. And this process repeats for every input word. Step three is to divide the score by the square root of the dimensionality of the key vector. In our case, the key vector has a size of 64 and the square root of that is eight. Step four is to apply the softmax function to the result. We get a vector of probabilities that add up to one, the same length as the input. Step five is to multiply each value vector by the softmax score. Step six is to sum up all the weighted value vectors from the previous step. This gives us the final output for the self-attention layer, which we'll call Z. Now by stacking all the input word embeddings from top to bottom in a matrix, we can make the calculation even faster. Step one is simply X times the Q weights equals Q, X times the K weights equals K, X times the V weights equals V, Step two is the softmax of Q times K transposed over the square root of key dimensions times V equals the output Z. The transformer paper further found that implementing multi-headed attention significantly improved results. How does it work? We do the calculations above eight times in parallel using independently trained weights. Then we one concatenate all the attention heads. Two, multiply with a weight matrix that was trained jointly with the model. And three, the result is a Z matrix that captures information from all the attention heads. The output from the multi-head attention then flows through a simple feed-forward network. This consists of two layers of fully connected neurons, input size 512, hidden layer 2048, and output size 512 according to the paper. Moving on, since we're not using a recurrent network, we need a way to signal the correct order of the words in the input sequence. The solution is to add a positional encoding to the input word embeddings. These vectors follow a specific pattern that the model learns, which helps it to determine the position of each word, as well as the distance between different words in the sequence. The values on the left half of the embedding use a sine function, and the values on the right half use a cosine function. One more detail about each layer. We're using a residual network, which means that each attention and feed forward layer has an escape valve, which allows input values to bypass that layer. We add the original input X to the attention output Z. Then we normalize the value and pass it into the feed forward network, which is residual as well and works exactly the same. And the original paper has six layers of encoders stacked up exactly like this one. Now let's move on to the decoder side. Notice that the output of the encoder stack is feeding into each individual layer of the decoder. Technically, we transform the output of the encoder stack into a set of attention vectors K and V, and those get passed in. The main difference on the decoder side is the addition of an encoder-decoder attention layer in the middle which receive the encoder K and V. This helps the decoder focus on the relevant parts of the input sentence. The encoder can process just about everything in parallel, 
but the decoder works step by step, one token at a time. One pass through the decoder network generates the first token, and the previously generated tokens are then fed back in as additional input. Just like in the input layer, we generate embeddings and add positional coding to the words of the output language. Since we are generating one word at a time, we don't want the self-attention mechanism attempting to look at words that we haven't generated yet. So we mask future positions by setting them to negative infinity just before the softmax step in the self-attention layer. Output words are now generated one at a time until a special EOS or end of sentence token is reached. The final layer of the decode stack outputs a vector of floats. How do we use this to generate a word? We've got an output layer the size of the vocabulary. Most models use tens of thousands of words, so it's a pretty big layer, which generates a value called a logit for every possible word. A softmax function then transforms these into probabilities, which add up to one across all possible words. We then choose the word with the highest probability using the argmax function. And if you want to learn more about the intricacies of training the network, I encourage you to continue reading the illustrated guide on your own. And if your head is spinning, I don't blame you. It took me a couple days to wrap my head around all the details. The trick to understanding is to go back and forth between the visual diagrams and the annotated source code in PyTorch, which I'll also leave the link to. I'll let you go over the annotated source code on your own time, but I will show you a very quick microwave popcorn way to play with a pre-trained version of this model. It's called Tensor to Tensor Intro, and I'll leave the link to this collab as well. Before you start, set the runtime type to GPU and connect to the runtime. First, install all the dependencies. Run the import section. You can skip MNIST because we don't care about that. Translate from English to German with a pre-trained model is what we want. Run everything to the bottom and you can play around with the sentence. The attention visualization is also quite fascinating. Run everything to the bottom and you can visualize all the attention weights that the network learned to translate the phrase that you put in. All right, this has been one protein pack lesson. If your head is spinning like mine was as I researched it, go through the links in the description and look further into any concepts you don't understand. Dear Diary, it's now day 30 of a horrible experiment gone wrong. A 2017 paper by Google Brain made the claim, attention is all you need. I set out to test the hypothesis. So I stopped eating and attempted to feed exclusively by seeking attention from others. I got fired from my job. My wife kicked me out of the house. But at least I managed to lose a good amount of weight. Lesson learned? Computer programming axioms don't translate well to human psychology. All right. We're quickly nearing the finale of Data Lit, but I've got at least a couple lessons left for you. Until next week, make that data lit and don't forget to learn from it.